Sunrise of Expectation, chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. The first day of the week cometh. Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, came into the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she ran and cometh unto Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, that being John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they have laid him. There, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. They ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and he went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lying there. And the napkin that was about its head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Everyone say this, and he saw and believed. And he saw and believed. For as yet, verse 9 is very important, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. How many of you can say, praise the Lord for his word? You know, I believe that first Easter was just like so many subsequent Easter's. I think that that first Easter morning was very much like this Easter morning. Amen. Some of you, many of you probably got up to get ready before the sun even came up. Maybe you felt a little bit like Mary felt because you can see Mary as she is stealing away in the night, making her way to the tomb. It had been uh, almost three days now that she had been away from her Lord. And this was the time and this was the moment that she would make her way to the tomb so that she could be next to her, her Savior and the lover of her soul. The Jews, listen, had already made the Romans put an extra unit of soldiers to secure the tomb. There were many who would love to have stolen the moment by removing the body and create a scandal. But the Jews had already heard that and whoever started it. And so they required that an extra unit of soldiers be set upon the tomb. Then there were the untouchables, those who wanted nothing to do with this just man. Pilate, after he had pronounced the judgment Upon Jesus, he washed his hands and he said, I wash my hands of this man because I find no fault in him. His wife had sent word to him while he was adjudicating and she said, I had a terrible dream about him and have nothing to do with this just man. So we see that there were many who wanted a scandal we see many that were the untouchables. Then there were the cynics like Herod, the freakish impresario who wanted to turn the whole thing into a circus. Don't think for a moment, folks, when he would receive Christ and then send him back to Pilate, that he was doing this out of any consciousness. He was doing this to turn it into a circus. That's the Herod of Scripture. You have people today, they're cynical about the resurrection. How can a man be crucified and then the third day rise from the dead? That's nothing but some fairy tale that Christians uh, appease themselves with and these cynics over and over. Talk about the lack of miracles in Scripture. But Mary Magdalene led the narrative, loving, tenacious, determined. Someone estimated 
that with all of the aloes and the perfume and the, and the oil and the myrrh, because if you read in Luke 24, you find she wasn't the only one woman who went to the tomb. There were others, but they estimated that all said they were probably carrying close to 100 pounds of aloe, perfume, and myrrh. Notwithstanding, what was she going to do with that stone? Hundreds and hundreds of pounds. How did she ever expect to move the stones? How did she expect to get beyond the soldiers? How many of you know with love there are no impossibilities? How many of you know with Jesus the word impossible is just the beginning of where he starts? There's nothing impossible with God. Jesus said if you believe all things are possible. I can't help but believe resonating in her mind were those words echoing that if you have faith as the size, the, the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to mountains and have them removed. Maybe that's what she was going to do. Maybe by now Mary's faith had grown so strong that she intended to move the stone by speaking to it. Don't you wish we had that kind of faith on Easter? Don't you wish that people would come with the mindset of victory rather than just coming to look at, at, at the color and the pageantry and the ceremony and the music that we came expecting miracles just like they did that first Easter morning. I got to tell you, there were three things. Before I do that, let me just tell you, it reminds me of the story of my friend Mario Ricardo loves this story. We, he laughs about it all the time. But there was a boy, and he, his parents took him to Sunday school on Easter. And uh, they dropped him off. And so he went into the Sunday school class. And the Sunday school teacher began by saying, Boys and girls, today is Easter. And David, the young boy that had been dropped off, David, Jesus, is missing from the tomb. Where is he? With that, David stood. He bolted out the door. He ran all the way home, nearly a mile from the church. When he got into the home, his dad jumped to his feet, and he said, David, what is wrong? He said, God is missing, and they're blaming me. Well, I've got news for you. He's not missing. He's not in the tomb, but he's not missing. Can you say amen to that? You see, Mary had gone for a ceremony of anointing a dead body, but when she arrived, there was a celebration of life. How many times have we in our faith, we have gone in so many words to anoint a dead body, Maybe we've gone to, to anoint a dead situation. Maybe we've gone to pronounce the end of a relationship. Maybe we've gone to pronounce the end of praying for that prodigal son or that prodigal daughter. But then to find out with resurrection power that nothing is impossible. And when the Spirit of God moves upon a situation, he transforms it from death to life. Amen. Hallelujah. And Easter is about life and not death. Amen. Hallelujah. There are three groups that define that first Easter morning and they define today's Easter celebration. Three groups I want to very hurriedly give to you. Number one, I want you to see the captivating crowd. The captivating crowd, the excitement that was felt by Mary and the, the other ladies were palpable. You ever awaken like an Easter Sunday or, or maybe it was just a given day and you woke with such excitement because you felt in your spirit something big is going to happen. You know, pastor, I came to church today expecting something great is going to happen. You know, I get letters from people that will tell me, pastor, I have a word for you. I have a prophetic word that God has spoken to me. 
And I want you to know, get ready, something great is about to happen. Do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, I get the other the things that say, you know, uh, the music was, was uh, too loud or too soft or too short or too long. The air was too cold or too hot, and right now it's too hot. Uh, parking was atrocious, or I love the new parking uh, uh, strips, and I love the new seats and all that. I get that, but listen, and I appreciate that. But when I hear someone say, I came expecting a miracle and Jesus touched me and I've never been the same since he touched me. Mary went to the tomb that day. It was going to be the third day since Mary and the others had been with Jesus. How many of you know that three days away from our Savior will make anyone miserable? Three days outside of the fellowship of our relationship with Christ, we would all be ready for a touch, ready for that relationship, ready to be in the presence of Jesus. Her passion in Luke 24, 1 explains it. It says, they came into the sepulcher bringing spices which they had prepared. I said already, how do you get that past soldiers? And how do you get that through a massive stone? It was faith. It was excitement. See Mary passing through the pre-dawn morning with one thing on her mind. She had to get to Jesus. On your way to church today, was that the preeminent thought in your mind? I just want to get in the presence of Jesus. To your, your wife, honey, I just can't wait to be in the presence of the Lord. Or your wife says to you, you know, I've been looking forward all week long to just bask in the presence of the Lord. Folks, if we would become more centralized in our, in our perspective, if we would look at Jesus and quit looking at these other things, if we had eyes and ears only for Jesus, think of the miracles and the blessings he would bestow upon us. Jesus is still doing miracles today. How many of you know that? What he did 2,000 years ago, he will do today. She had to get to Jesus. Jesus said this, however. He said, one is your master. Let me read what else Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Do you know the parable of the pearl of great price? The merchant man, after he had been looking for pearls his whole life, he finally found that one pearl of great price. And when he found the pearl of great price, you know what he did? He went and sold everything else that he had so he could purchase that one pearl. He didn't need ten pearls. He didn't need two pearls. He needed that one pearl of great price. Listen to me, beloved. Jesus is the pearl of great price. One is your master. You cannot love Jesus and the world. Now, if that had been you on that first Easter, what would you have taken to the tomb? If you had been Mary, what is it that you would have taken to him to place at his feet or to place at the tomb? What would it be? Would it be a car? Would it be the deed to your home? Would it be some property? Would it be a savings account? You know, it's hard for us to let go of some things that we hold so dear. There are many of us, we would serve Christ with every, every ounce of energy we had were it not for something else. Pastor, I would serve God with all my heart if it weren't for this relationship I'm in. You don't understand, Pastor. I would give it all away to serve Jesus. And listen to me, that is exactly what Jesus asked of the rich young ruler. 
He said, so you've kept the commandments. That's wonderful. But you love other things more than you love the kingdom of God. You cannot serve God and mammon. Listen to me. I'm not going to be with you. I'm not going to try and trick you and make you think that you can come to the front today and you can give your life to Jesus and hold to everything that's in your life. He may ask you to give up many things, a lot of things, or he may ask you to give up nothing. But you must be willing to put it all at the altar. How many of you can say amen to this? But I want you to understand something. Mary knew the importance of time. Let's remember, Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath. In honor of it, it was a day of silence, no activity, no travel. So she waited patiently. Follow what I'm saying. This was the first opportunity that Mary could go to the tomb. And she went even before the first light of dawn. But Mary knew the timing of God. They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. She waited. Time is one of the greatest commodities we have. And not only that, listen. Even after she went and told Peter and John, and they came and looked into the tomb and left, she stayed there and waited. Some of you right now, you're waiting for something to happen, and you've waited so long, you've given up. Listen to me. Trust in God. Put it in God's hands and wait upon God. He will open the door at the right moment. You don't have to make something happen. Do you hear me? You don't have to make something happen. If you abuse time, time will abuse you. Time is on your side. Use it wisely. Mary stayed, then stayed at the tomb. John 20 and 11 says that. But I want you to also see her possessions. Mary Magdalene came to the sepulcher and she brought something to Jesus that was the treasure of her life. It characterized her love for her Savior. I'll ask you again, what would you bring? What would you bring that would characterize the love that you have for Jesus? Would it be a savings account? Would it be some degree? Would it be some honor that you had? Or would it be something that was so unimportant to the world, but it was the treasure of your life to give to him? Mary Magdalene, whom we have heard so much about, Mary, when she, excuse me, Mary of Bethany, when she uh, had the alabaster jar, so many people think that she was doing this out of a spontaneous time. But listen, when Jesus came to her house and they made a supper and they served Jesus, this was not, you know, some quick epiphany that she had. She didn't suddenly say, oh, yeah, I've got an alabaster jar. I think I'll go and get that and take it to Jesus. Do you know how long she planned? Do you know how long she prepared? Do you know how long she contrived for that moment? She waited for the right moment. And she did something that no one else, no other woman would have done. In fact, in the first service, I said, I could just see Martha in the kitchen. She's washing the dishes. She's working feverishly. And over her shoulders, she sees the shadow of Mary passing by, and she saw that Mary had something in her hand. She no doubt thought to herself, what is she doing? We've served food. We've served refreshments. Now the men are gathered. It's against protocol for a woman to insinuate herself in the middle of men, especially in conversation. It's really, truly not acceptable in the law for a woman to go and place herself in the midst of men. So I 
I believe that she peeped around the door thinking, what is Mary doing? And I can see Mary taking this alabaster jar. And she steps over. They were in a circle. They were lounging after dinner. And she, she goes over and she, she pulls up her skirt and she steps over one of the men. Scandal. Who is she? What is she doing? She lifts the other leg. She has eyes only for Jesus. She's not listening to criticism. She's not listening to the murmuring. She has eyes only for Jesus. And Jesus stops and he waits and she comes and falls at his feet. And then she does something so unlikely. She takes the most expensive thing in her life, the pearl of great price, her alabaster jar, which is equivalent to a full year's salary. And in the midst of these men and, and uh, the detractors and, and the people like uh, uh, the, the, the crooks and, and those who would steal like Judas, she takes the alabaster box and she breaks it. Suddenly, listen, perfume begins to fill the air. It wafts through the house. Every room can smell the beautiful odor of the alabaster. She takes that box and pours it on Jesus' feet and then takes her hair and wipes his feet with her hair. The murmuring begins. What kind of a woman is this? What kind of a woman goes and stands in the middle of men? Is she a prostitute? Is she trying to sell herself? And then she takes the rest and she pours it over the head of Jesus while they were waiting for Jesus to rebuke this woman who loved Christ more than life itself, Jesus said, leave her alone. She has done something no one else has done. And wherever this story is repeated, her name will go down as a memorial of love for her master and savior. I ask myself, have I ever done anything that brave? I don't think I have ever done anything that bold. But Mary Magdalene, on that first Easter, she doesn't care what others think. Mary of Bethany, she doesn't care what others think. And it's time that you and I understand it doesn't matter what others think. Let me say this to you. When Mary Bethany broke the alabaster box, you've heard me say this many times, Jesus can't use anything that can't be broken. Did you know that? When they brought the five loaves and two fishes, what did Jesus do? He broke it. When they were in the upper room and they were about to partake of the bread and the wine, what did Jesus do? He took the bread and he broke it. What did he do when Paul cried out and he said, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh? Jesus said, no, Paul, you need to be broken. Even the ship that carried Paul on his missionary journey had to be broken. David said, the sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Listen to me. Whatever you have that you want to bring to Jesus, if it can't be broken, don't give it to Jesus. You say, well, you don't know how many degrees I have. Let Jesus break it. You don't know the kind of educational pride I have. Let Jesus break it. And when he breaks it, he can do more with it when it's broken than when it's in your hand and my hand. Hallelujah. Whatever you love or possess or cherish, you can't get to the tomb unless you go by way of the cross, and it has to be broken. Number two, very quickly. There was 
not only that first group of people, the captivating crowd, there was secondly the cosmetic crowd. You see the confusing scenario. When Peter and John came to the open tomb, they should have been singing the hallelujah chorus. They should have been singing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I have a future. But they thought this was just an expansion of Friday. They thought that this was just another part of the suffering of our Savior. They thought the Romans were up to a trick. Nothing was farther from the truth. They were blinded. Verse 9 of John 20 explains it all. It says, but they did not understand the resurrection. Some today, in fact, Peter was content to extend the conspiracy theory. The tomb is empty, and what they do with his body? But they really represent the cosmetic crowd that attends church every Easter. The CEOs, if you will. But listen, some churches make their whole religion out of the crucifixion. They never take Jesus off the cross. In fact, they'll even bronze Jesus on the cross and wear it around their necks because to them, that is the end. The cross is it. But let me tell you something, folks. The cross is where he crushed the serpent's head, but then he went into the bowels of the earth. On Saturday, when everything was quiet, no one was moving. It was the Sabbath Jesus went into the bowels of the earth and he led captivity captive. He brought the keys to death, hell, and the grave and he conquered our sins forevermore. There are a lot of people today they never let Jesus down from the cross. Don't get me wrong. They love all the pomp and ceremony of Easter, the hats and the dresses and the colors and the songs, but they're more intrigued by gray clothes and shrouds and linens and the body not being found. Folks, that's not Easter. That is a scandal. Easter is there is no body in the tomb because he is risen. I said he is risen. You go to Moscow, you can see the body of linen that's been entombed for years. You can go to Beijing, you can see a bloated feature, a mousy tongue. They put so much formaldehyde in his body that his body almost exploded. But you go to Jerusalem today, on Sunday, listen to me. Oh, there were thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands who walked the Via Dolorosa, the seven stages of the cross. And that's all well and fine. But Sunday is the consummation. Sunday is the victory. Sunday means our salvation has been sealed forever. Do I hear an amen? Amen. They were more intrigued, as I said, by grave clothes. Easter is not, or Easter rather, is about a living, risen Savior. Listen to me carefully. It's that no grave was going to keep our Lord down because he got up. He was crucified, speared, bloated, murdered, but he got up. He was beaten. He was bludgeoned. He was shamed. He was killed, but he got up. (laughs) Jesus was hanged in public. He was mocked. He was ridiculed, spit upon, laughed at, and murdered, but he got up. I said he got up. We didn't come here today. We didn't come here on this blessed Easter to lament a death. We've come today to celebrate life because he got up. I said he got up. I want you to know, I bring my handkerchief to church with me. Most of the time, it's to catch all the sweat. 
Occasionally, I bring it for reasons of crying and weeping. But folks, I didn't bring this handkerchief here today to cry. It's not something to cry about. This is a celebration of victory. We need to be waving all of our tears. We need to be waving our handkerchiefs. He is alive. I said Jesus is alive. He's not in the grave. He's not in the grave. He got up. He got up. I want you to say it with me. He got up. He was in the grave, but he got up. Hallelujah. The last point, and I close with this. There's the cavalier crowd. If you read John 20, all the way down to verse 25, you see, verse 24, rather, after Jesus had been seen, he walked through the walls where disciples were. And he said, peace be unto you. Second time, peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Thomas, Thomas wasn't there. He's part of the cavalier crowd. Thomas, one of the 12, 24, verse 24 says, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said unto them, except I shall see in his, in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. How many of you know that there are a lot of doubting Thomases and murmuring Marthas? There are many sitting at home today eating Oreos, <laughs> Kellogg's Pop Tarts. They're watching the political pundits, wondering who does Donald Trump's hair. And why Hillary won't wear a skirt. <laughs> they watch all of that while we celebrate the greatest event in the history of mankind that he is not dead. He is alive forevermore. They put him in a grave. They killed him, but he got up. I said he got up. I want you to say hallelujah, he got up. There was a teacher at school and she told her students, it was spring and just about Easter and she said to her students, she said, tomorrow I want you to bring, as your assignment, I want you to bring a plastic egg to class. And I want each one of you to place inside that plastic egg something that reminds everyone what life is. The next day, the kids came with these plastic eggs. You could feel the excitement. One kid by the name of little Joe, who was mentally challenged, he was bristling with excitement. He placed his egg right in the front before all of the other eggs. And the teacher noticed it, and for fear of potential embarrassment, she took it and she moved it down the line. And so they brought up first a young girl. And the girl said these words, I looked for something that reminds me of life. And she opened her egg and showed a beautiful daisy flower. And she said, flowers bloom in spring, and that's life. So the teacher again moved little Joe's egg down. He grabbed this, she grabbed the second one, called for the owner, and it was another young girl. The girl came up and she held the egg and she said, I thought about what it, it is or what reminds me of life 
And she opened her egg, and a beautiful yellow butterfly flew away. And she said, butterflies grow from caterpillars, and that's life. Finally, little Joe could stand it no longer. He jumped to his feet, and he grabbed his egg. Before the teacher could stop him, he opened the plastic egg, and it was empty. The little boy smiled from ear to ear. The teacher sadly tried to take it from his hand because the egg was empty. But he said, teacher, show them the egg. She said, but Joe, the egg is empty. And she said, so is Jesus' tomb, and that's life. <laughs> stand to your feet with me. Stand with me. Everyone stand with me. Folks, the grave is empty. The tomb is empty, folks. All they found were linen clothes. But that's life. I'm going to ask one simple question to everyone here. You may be in the music suite. You may be in the reception room. You may be out on the foyer. You may be the balcony in the back. But I'm going to ask you, is there anyone here today who would say, Pastor Boykin, I'm away from Christ. I don't know him as my personal Savior. And today I want to know, as we close in prayer, I want to know that I know that I know that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that I'm headed to heaven. God should call me home today. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. With heads bowed and eyes closed, how many of you would say, Pastor, I can't say I know, but I want you to pray for me. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand up and down. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of hands in the balcony. Any on the main floor? Just raise your hand up and down very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly.